We get to take a look at the Gospel of Mark. We're continuing there. And we're actually going to recover some of the things I just touched on last week at the end of the passage and give a little more detail, a little more commentary on some, some verses which are not always easy to interpret. Now let's, let's read the passage first. We're going to begin in Luke chapter 11 at verse 22. Now Jesus is answering his disciples after they had seen that the fig tree that Jesus had cursed had withered. And Jesus gives an answer, which doesn't seem at first to be an answer, but let's look at it and then we'll talk. And Jesus answered, saying to them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain be taken up and cast into the sea and doesn't doubt in his heart but believes that what he says is going to happen it will be granted him. Therefore, I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them and they will be granted you. Whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone so that your Father who is in heaven, will also forgive your transgressions. Father in heaven, as we come to this passage on faith and prayer and forgiveness, we pray that you would teach us what all these things are. We pray that you would help us to have understanding, strengthen our faith, strengthen our hope, strengthen our mercy. We commit ourselves in this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever prayed for a mountain to be moved? That's one thing I haven't prayed for. And I suspect most of you haven't prayed for that either. And if you have, I'm guessing you were disappointed. You didn't see it on the news that mountains moved miraculously at least. But how about this? Have you ever prayed for a person who had a horrible disease to be healed? That's something that perhaps most of us have prayed for. And if I were to take a survey, maybe some of you would be able to say that you have seen some healings which were unexplainable except by the power of God. But also, there's probably many, if not most, where that hasn't been the outcome. You've prayed and yet a, a loved one was lost. It seemed like the prayer was fruitless. Was there something... Wrong with the prayer? Was there something wrong with the faith of the one praying such that it didn't get answered? Our passage today has this fascinating part in it, verse 23, where it talks about whoever says to this mountain, be taken up, cast the sea, doesn't doubt but believes that it's going to happen and, 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 and just makes this bold statement. And it seems like with the, the right kind of prayer, you can pray for anything and it's going to come to pass. And then it's followed up by verse 24, explaining it, saying, therefore, I say to you all things, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them and they'll be granted. These are incredible promises. And so incredible that we don't find them to be credible. And when we look at a passage like this, we tend to come up with some kind of explanation which takes the the incredibleness away, and and we can't even see any encouragement in it. We don't know what to do with it. So many questions come up. I, I look at commentaries, and the authors just list these questions, and it's reasonable to ask those. When Jesus says, whenever you ask, For anything, or whatever you ask, the ESV says, does he mean that we can ask for absolutely anything? Are are there no restrictions? Don't answers to prayer depend on what we ask for? And when Jesus says that we're now to doubt but believe, is he saying that in order to have our prayers answered, that we must have some kind of undoubting faith that God will give us the very thing we ask for Is that what has to happen? Is that what this means? Well, we see this passage and and we know we have to deal with it somehow because we pray and we don't get everything that we ask for, do we? So we make qualifications and we 
have so many different qualifications that at some point we're left with no encouragement at all. And, and we need to fit it into our experience. And usually that happens in one of a few ways. First, like I said, we, we qualify it. We, we say, it doesn't really mean what it says. So it can end up that we really don't pray for much. We don't actually pray for things that would require a mighty act of God at all. Or, or when we do pray, we don't really expect anything to happen. We just think that we're supposed to pray, so we pray. It almost makes it like, why, why have this verse at all? Of course, another popular way to deal with it is to make it about your faith or, or your doubt. You need to muster up enough faith. And, and if you do that, that'll happen. If it doesn't happen, though, the problem is with me. I blame myself. I haven't had enough faith. That's the name it and claim it type of way of looking at these passages. And it's a way that can, can be so cruel, so devastating. When, when you see situations where you have like a, a parent with a, a daughter who has a, a disease like cancer, and people come around and try and encourage and, and give hope and say, just pray, and if you, if you have enough faith, they'll be made well. The child dies. And not only dealing with the grief of a lost child, you're dealing with the coolness of someone who says, if only you had enough faith, she'd still be with us. Devastating. Because that's not what this is talking about. It's not what it means. But this is what happens when, on the one hand, the passage is abused, on another hand, it's reasoned away, and we shy away from the hope and the encouragement. And, and the misunderstanding takes us from what we really have here is an encouraging passage. And I, I go through commentators and, and listening to other people talk about a passage like this, and usually they start and say, what an encouraging passage. What a wonderful thing that God gives these, these promises. And then it starts listing these hundreds of qualifications and takes it down. And it's appropriate to take qualifications because there are things that we need to understand about this passage so that it fits in with our understanding of what Christ has revealed. But I'm going to start the other way. I'm going to start with the qualifications of what this really means. And then hopefully when we're done, we will understand something that is encouraging. See, what we have here, when we take this verse in context... When we take it in the context of the passage and the whole of Scripture, we see that there is something hopeful and encouraging going on here as Jesus instructs his disciples about what empowered discipleship is. And prayer is just one part of empowered discipleship. And it's tied together with these three aspects that are are outlined for today about empowered discipleship. Three lessons, faith, prayer, and mercy. That's what's laid out in these verses here, and hopefully it encourages us in the right direction so that we will be empowered disciples, fruitful disciples. And if you're tracking with sermon titles last week, the title was Fruitless, and this week it is Fruitful, giving a contrast to unbelieving Israel. If you remember last week, the passage that we covered, it was talking about Jesus' instruction to the disciples as he was pronouncing judgment on Israel. And this condemnation of the whole religious system, the temple system that was going on in Jerusalem that time, was illustrated by this acted parable of a fig tree being cursed. Remember, he came into Jerusalem and he saw this fig tree that had all these green leaves, and he goes up to it looking for fruit, and it had none, and he cursed the tree. And then he went into the temple, and he saw what was going on there, and he basically was pronouncing a judgment by overturning tables and he was enacting another condemnation on them for their lack of faith. And then they came back and they saw that the fig tree had been withered. And this parable was showing that though the tree looked like it should bear fruit and though the the religious system looked like it should produce something, it was empty of true faith. The fruitfulness was not there, although it had all the religious trappings. And Israel was called to be fruitful, but they failed. The temple, we saw, was supposed to be a house of prayer for the nations. Israel was supposed to be a beacon to the nations so that they would be drawn to the worship of the true God. But instead, it had become filled with barriers which 
kept people from true worship and exploiting people. It became about works and rituals and there was no fruit and the system is going down. It's under the curse of God. But an appropriate understanding for those who want to have faith in the Lord is what's going to take its place? What's going to take the place of the temple? It's, it's not the first time there hasn't been a temple. The, the Jews have been cast off before. The, the temple had been destroyed when they were carried away by Babylon. But there was still a sense of Jerusalem being the place of worship. Even Daniel, when they were in captivity in Babylon, he would bow down towards Jerusalem because it still signified the presence of God. So what's going to take its place? Where will the nations pray? What will be the beacon? What will be the focal point? And you remember last time we talked about how Jews regarded prayer in the temple as being particularly effective. But Jesus is preparing them now for faith apart from the temple system. How to be fruitful in the ministry that he will leave his disciples How to live as Christ followers, away from the system, away from the rituals, away from the sacrifice. And Jesus gets at that answer when he responds to their surprise, their amazement at the withered fig tree. They say in verse 21, look, it's withered. And in the parallel passage in Matthew's account, they ask the question, how did it wither so fast? And Jesus answers in the Matthew parallel, he says, if you have faith, you can do what I did to this fig tree, and even more. You can cast mountains into the sea. What Jesus did to the fig tree, you're going to be able to do as well. Your ministry, your your mission, true faith is going to continue. This passage talks about how. It talks about the enablement for for the, the mission, the commission that he leads them. And it's going to come about by having faith. And God, God's people are, are still going to function without the temple, without the old religious system. And, and the effectiveness of prayer has nothing to do with any of that temple or sacrifices anymore. But it has everything to do with the right faith in God. And let's see how Jesus teaches this. Your first point, faith is the first aspect of empowered discipleship. And he, and he starts out with maybe an obvious statement. Empowered discipleship has to start with a belief in God. Have faith in God. And, and we know that the author of Hebrews, he, he breaks out this, says that it's, an, it's, it's impossible to please God without faith. And, and the one who comes to God, he's got to obviously believe that he exists and he's a rewarder of those who seek him. But the problem was the, the, the religious people didn't have faith in God. So it's not so obvious when you understand the contrast that there are so many people who put faith in all sorts of things, but not God, even though they say it's God. And, and everyone has some form of faith. Even the atheist has faith. The atheist has faith that there, there's nothing beyond this world and the laws of nature explain everything. That's what their reliance is on. When we say faith is, is reliance on something, trust in something, they're, they're believing in something about reality and they shape their life on it. All religions have some kind of understanding of what they put their reliance on. And the Jews, functionally, when Jesus comes into the temple, were putting their reliance on the temple system, going there and offering sacrifices, being a Jew and and being someone who is of the promised seed. Well, then I'm okay, and if I do all these things, then I'll be saved. And if, if that's what our reliance is on, it's different than having our reliance in God. So we've seen this system... This way of life that is trusting in all these things. And he says, you have faith in God. And notice, he's not just saying this out of context. We we understand in Mark, when, when he says God, these disciples have started to come to understanding of what God is doing in him. In Jesus, right? All throughout the Gospel of Mark, Jesus has been demonstrating that he is the messenger of God. He has the power of God. He has the authority of God. He has the prerogatives of God. And the disciples came to understand that he is the Messiah of God. He is the one in whom all the purposes, all the plans of God are going to be fulfilled and come to fruition. 
So he has faith in God. He's saying, no, you still continue to have faith in God. And everything that you've come to faith in, you still need to cling to those things. And they don't understand yet, but that faith in God is going to come even more clear when he dies and rises again from the dead. And that faith in God is going to include his death and resurrection as the new center for dealing with a sacrifice for sins. Now, he's the one that God is working his purposes in. And Jesus is saying, don't doubt what God is doing. When I come up to Jerusalem and and I'm killed, don't doubt what you've come to believe that God is doing, that I'm the Messiah. Don't, Don't doubt that my life was in vain. Don't doubt that it was a loss. Keep having faith in God. And notice the tense here, it's not about coming to faith. He doesn't say, start having faith. Don't, don't become converted. The sense is, continue in it. Continue in faith. This isn't, this isn't some command for, for some unbeliever to have some bootstrap, go get faith. Because faith is a gift. Remember when the disciples came to the conclusion that he was the Christ? Jesus said to him, where did that come from? It wasn't from flesh and blood. But my Father in heaven revealed this to you. It was a gift that they could understand who Jesus was and they could see the beauty of it. See, God gives faith. He gives eyes to see the truth and believe its reality and desire the beauty. It's not something that's earned. It's something that is given. So this isn't a call to faith, but this is an encouragement to continue in faith. Don't give up. You've come to see these things about God. Cling to them. Cling to Him. You need to continue in it. And God will use you for great things. I don't know if we understand how encouraging this would be to disciples to remember this when persecution does come. When it seems like the world is coming down. The authorities are coming against the disciples. Is God God still working things out? Is he still going to accomplish his purposes? You think about the original audience of Mark when they got this. This is probably written during a time around when the persecution in Rome started to happen. Persecuted Christians are, are, are seeing things and have faith in God. That's what they're encouraged to continue in. So an exhortation we need as well. When things don't seem to work out the way we planned or the way we intended or, or the world is trying to make us compromise, we need the encouragement to continue to have faith in God and what he says and what his promises are. To wait on the Lord and, and don't look anywhere else because that is the temptation that we start to look elsewhere for solutions. Now, the, the issue is having the right object of faith. Not, 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 not how much faith I have, but having the right object of faith. When, when we say trust in God, believe in God, it, it's, it's reliance on his purpose, his person, his character, his plans, all that he is. And we submit to it. When, when we understand that God is the one who rules all, determines all, who made us, if we believe that, we align ourselves under that willingly. We, we want to follow his wisdom, his knowledge. We trust that he uses his power for his purposes. We we see that it's his power that withered a fig tree. And they're saying, this is amazing. Trust in God. He's the one who has the power. They're going to see in a little while the power of God in the resurrection. That is a testimony to who this God is. We can look at the heavens. The heavens declare the glory of God. They say that this is a God who is powerful And we trust in him, the one who can speak forth words and the universe leaps into existence. You see all this demonstration. Continue to have faith in God, the one who's behind all of it. And trust that this God does all things for his glory. This is the God who has revealed himself in scripture as the one who does everything For his glory, and he works all things together for good, for his glory, and for those who love him. 
So if I have this view of God and I have faith in this God, it's not a me-centered universe. It's not a me-centered faith. It's a God-centered faith. And it, and it makes me want to align him if I really have this kind of faith. If I have that kind of faith, it's going to shape my desires. And here's the important part. It shapes what I ask for. Because that leads into our next point about prayer. We, we need to keep this kind of faith in mind when we look at these two verses on prayer. What kind of things does a person of faith ask for? If a person trusts in God and his ways, does he ask for things which would exalt Satan? No. Does he pray for things that would exalt an anti-God purpose? No. So when he says, all things for which you ask and pray, or again, the ESV, whatever you ask in prayer... When I'm praying with faith, it shapes the whatever. I'm not going to ask for things that don't consider God's glory. And and if I do, I'm not praying in faith. I'm praying in unbelief. And we all struggle with that. But we need to understand that he's saying basically what James says. Go go to James chapter 4. This is how a passage like this fits in the scripture. We've got to harmonize all these things. In James chapter 4, he's talking in that chapter about how, how conflicts, they come about from our wrong desires in our heart. And it works out in prayer too. Verse 4, or, or verse 3 of chapter 4, it says, You ask and don't receive. Why? Because you ask wrongly. You ask to spend it on your passions. You're not asking for God's glory. You're asking for selfish reasons. And God's not going to grant a prayer that's not according to his purposes and will. He's not going to grant something that's just going to be squandered on anti-God priorities. And that's why we have a similar passage on prayer we need to harmonize it with in 1 John chapter 5. That's why John gives a qualifier. The, the, the whatever we ask for has to be according to his will. Look at what it says in John chapter 5 verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have towards him. That if we ask anything, ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever I ask, we we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. So, So we see by these two passages, the whatever that we ask for is a whatever that's not selfish, And it's a whatever that is according to God's will. Those are the qualifiers. We understand that the term whatever can have a limit to it. That's the way language works. It doesn't mean anything I can possibly conceive of. In context, language, whatever, usually has some kind of limits. We understand that. When I go home and my wife asks me what I want to have for dinner, and I say whatever... Right? Neither of us are expecting her to serve up my slippers, right? That, that's not in the range of what I mean by whatever. What I have in the range of whatever is that which is edible. That's what's in the house. Another example, an old example from when they used to have Sears catalogs, they used to send these big catalogs of things that you could buy from Sears, right? And you would get these catalogs, and you can order whatever you want. It has to be in the catalog, right? You can't order something outside of the catalog. Here, order whatever. We understand with language that there's limits. So here, if I have a prayer of faith, I only want what's in God's catalog. I only want what he wants, what's according to his will. So so we don't have to take whatever here to mean absolutely anything without restriction. It's limited to what's according to God's will. So so then we, we go on and say, okay, so is moving mountains part of God's will? Can I even pray for the specific thing that Jesus mentions? Well, here, again, we need to understand the nature of language. Jesus means something by it, but I don't think he's saying to his disciples to go around and start doing miraculous excavation. That's not his point. He's using what we call a figure of speech or an idiom. 
And we understand those things. When we hear terms like, he's making a mountain out of a molehill, what do you picture? We don't assume that he's out in the yard, taking 12 inches and mounting it up to be Mount Spokane, right? That's not what we're assuming. We understand it's a figure of speech. And Jesus didn't make this up. This is a, this is a figure of speech here. It's an idiom. And when he says moving mountains, it means that something incredible, something impossible even is being done. Now, it might not mean a mountain, but this is still pretty significant. Here, and if you're still in 1 John 5, 14, he's basically saying, if you do ask this, even if it's something incredible, even something humanly impossible, if you're doing it in accordance with God's will, he will answer it. This isn't some qualification. Well, he sometimes answers some of your requests if you really, really have enough faith. No, he's saying he will answer your prayer if you ask this way. That's an amazing promise. It's it's fascinating what he's saying here. God will give us what we ask according to his will. He loves to answer our prayers when our prayers are according to his will. It's not a, a way of getting God to do our will. Right? It's according to his will. And sometimes you, you've heard maybe the analogy of, of what prayer's like. It's like the, the guy with a boat anchor and he throws the boat anchor and he pulls it in. And the, the, the goal isn't when he pulls in the anchor to pull the land closer to him. Right? The goal is that he's pulled closer to land. Right? Prayer's like that. We're, we're not trying to throw out our prayers and, and draw God's will to do what we want. If we have a prayer of faith, it's that we might be drawn into what God would have what his plans and purposes are. That's what faith is about. That's how it tempers this. So, now we ask, how do we know God's will? We can just say, well, maybe if I pray enough, if I pray for enough things, maybe occasionally I'll hit it right and he'll answer it. That's more like the lottery. That's not praying without doubt. How, How can I pray without doubt? It says if you pray without doubting. How can I pray without doubting unless I know it already? So somehow, we have to know what God's will is. How do we know God's will? Except what he's revealed to us by his promises. Or or what he's, he's spoken to us through the prophets. And then it goes back to faith again. It goes into trusting what God has said and done. Isn't that the nature of faith? We're in a culture where we're used to talking about faith without an object. Oh, just have faith. And it's more of a have positive thinking, a cheer me up type of thing. It's a, it's a hallmark faith, right? A greeting card type faith where just cheer me up and I have to have faith in something. And when I have faith in God, I'm trusting in who he is and what he has promised. And if he hasn't promised it, well, then, how can I ask for it without doubting? Take healing. Has he promised that he will heal us of our every disease this size of eternity? No, but sometimes you hear people, it's like, you're going to get better, just have faith. But it's not biblical faith because he has not promised that he would do that. Right? You can pray in faith to say that there is a God who's powerful enough to do that if he wants to. And if we submit to his will and, and we have a prayer of faith, we say we can say that I know that if this would glorify your name more, you can and will do it. But I can't pray without doubting unless he's told me. So what's an example of that type of faith? We read it earlier in Romans 4. Go there again, if you would, please. Here's an example of, of faith that latched onto the miraculous. Here we have Abraham, who God made a promise to. Remember, God said that I'm going to bless all the families of the earth, and I'm going to make great nations out of you. I'm going to be the father of many nations. But here he is as an old man, and he has no children. How's he going to be the father of nations with, with no children? 
And we picked up at verse 18. And, and here's hope against hope. Hope against the reality he still believed. The reality that he was unable at his age to, to even have children, at least naturally. He believed so that he might become a father of many nations according to that which had been spoken. Because God had spoken something. Your descendants are going to be like the stars of the heaven. And he didn't become weak in faith as he as he contemplated his own body being as good as dead. His, his natural ability to have kids was gone and his wife's too. And it says he didn't waver. He didn't doubt. He was fully convinced that God was able to do Here's what it says. Do what he promised. God had promised something and Abraham believed it. It was counted to him as righteousness. He didn't doubt because he had a word from God. Right? We understand that when someone gives a word, if they're a credible testimony, we can act on it. I will be home at five o'clock for dinner. You can put the dinner in so it's ready if you trust in that promises. But if it's unbelievable, you don't trust it. Right? But when you have God behind a promise and he makes these statements, they are sure. They are certain. And Abraham believed and the miraculous happened. He became the father of many nations. See, the kind of faith that we're talking about isn't about power in my faith. It's a power with God. It's always about God. In his power, not what I muster up. And by the way, in Mark, the tense on moving mountain there, it's not like I move the mountain by my faith. It's mountain be moved, be moved by someone else, be moved by God. God is the one who can move mountains. God has all the power. Faith doesn't. And we get it all distorted when we put our faith in our ability to have faith, right? It becomes faith in positive thinking, and, and we don't need a great amount of faith. We, we need mustard seed faith. You remember in Luke 17, the, talking about forgiveness again, the disciples were called to forgive someone seven times a day, and they're like, whoa, Lord, increase our faith. And, and Jesus says, you don't need more faith. This is essentially what he's saying. He's saying faith like a mustard seed can tell this tree to be uprooted and be planted into the sea. It's not, it's not more faith you need. You need the kind of faith that trust in what God says, and you'll obey and forgive. The kind of faith that trusts that God's purposes are right. And, and then you just do it. You just believe in it. So that's the kind of faith. Even little faith can just say, yeah, God said it. So, we can pray God's will by praying his promises, and, and, and that's praying from his catalog. Now, how does that work out? How, how do we pray with that kind of confidence? And I appreciate one author. He, he really helped me think through this. And, and he, he took an example. It's like, how do we pray for someone who has cancer? Say this is, this is a Christian. This is a believer. Someone who's trusted in the Lord, and, and, and they're going to heaven, and they have cancer, but they're struggling with a bitter attitude. It's full of, full of bitterness. Why me? And, and there's pain in their bodies and, and they're just crying out in despair. What do you pray for this person? What does it mean to pray according to God's will for a person like that? I mean, you could pray that they be healed, right? Again, we don't have a promise for that. You could pray that God would take them out quickly so they wouldn't suffer so much. Or maybe, maybe you should pray that God would rebuke their rebellion. There, there's instances of all those in Scripture where people are healed, where people are taken out because of their sin. Or maybe, maybe we pray and just list all the options we can think of, and then we say, here, God, your will be done. You pick. Or we just bypass that whole chain, and, and we don't even need to list the option because we just say, thy will be done, and it's a real short prayer. I mean, isn't that how we end up most of the time? Thy will be done. I will be done. Right, but the, the kind of according to the will here isn't just God's secret will, which, which we don't know. Praying according to his will includes praying according to his revealed will. How, how, else do I, how else do I pray according to his will unless it's revealed? I can't pray according to a secret will. I can only pray according to what he's revealed. 
So how do I pray for this person? Are, are there promises which we can pray? If we think through this, this can transform how we pray. Yeah, we can pray for the healing, and, and we know healing will ultimately come in the resurrection. But can we pray with confidence, Lord? Keep your promise to have this one's faith endure to the end. Lord, if, if they're a believer, God, would you keep your promise not to lose this one? Lord, don't lose any of your sheep. Don't let them be snatched out of your hand. Lord, keep your word to bring this person through so that they will end in faith. And, and maybe that'll mean taking them out right away. Maybe it'll mean encouraging them by some miraculous healing. But we're praying what God has promised, that he will keep those to the end. He's able to keep to the end. And so we pray God's will. And you have it. Isn't that how prayer goes? We've talked about this before. With like the Lord's Prayer, for example. Lord, may your name be holy. Is his name holy? Yeah. Will it be holy? Will it someday be exalted? We pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. Is that going to happen? Is that a promise? But we're praying his promises back. Will he give us our daily bread? Yes, he said that. We're praying according to his will. And he's pleased to answer those things. In in, in God's God's design and his providence, he, he accomplishes things through means, which is our prayer. Would the person that we pray for endurance, would they have continued in the faith if we hadn't prayed? Or is it the means that God continues? Well, he uses means. Now, maybe if we didn't pray, they'd still be saved because God would have moved in someone else's heart to pray. But the same thing goes with things like in the church. Part of the means that God keeps us on the path of faith is exhortation from one another. And if we, no one would exhort someone, they might fall away from the faith. But God works in people's hearts so that they would exhort and keep true believers on the path. He ordains the means as well as the ends. And when we pray according to his will, he is pleased to answer. Amazing promises. So when we pray that way, do we have an expectation that God will act for his glory? Do we pray with a desire to, to magnify his glory in his name? And again, I said this could, this could transform our type of praying. Instead of just praying, Lord, fix my car. I pray, Lord, give me endurance to still hope and trust in you as my car is out of commission. When someone comes to you and say, would you pray for me? My daughter's sick. You can pray according to the will, Lord. Give them a peace which passes understanding. Help them in the midst of these things. Now, God uses means to make the peace occur too, but we do have promises for some things. He will keep them enduring. And we see that the disciples, they did amazing things because they were commissioned by the Lord to to take the gospel and open it up to new areas, and and they did amazing things in faith, healing people. As God had revealed to them, Jesus had told them what their purposes were. And told them that they would have such power. So so what this means, though, is if we're going to pray this way, we need to understand more about what God's will is. We need to be in his word, looking at it. And and there's sometimes we still don't know, isn't there? Romans 8 talks about how the Spirit intercedes for us when we don't know how to pray. But we can always pray that the Son would be exalted. There's an example of of a man who, who who prayed earnestly to God, but he didn't pray according to God's revealed will because he didn't know. And that's in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 where, where Paul prays, he pleads with God three times that a thorn be removed out of his flesh. He wanted the thorn out of his flesh. And he's crying out to God in petition. Now, we don't think Paul is a man who lacked faith, but he didn't have the knowledge of what God really intended for that situation until the Lord spoke to him. And you know what he said, right? My grace is sufficient. 
My strength is perfected in weakness. Now Paul understood what God's will was for the thorn in his flesh. And then he said, now therefore I rejoice in my weakness because Christ would be exalted. That's faith. That's having faith. And that's an informed faith. And Paul, he was more glorified in weakness than in strength. So empowered discipleship is prayerful discipleship. And it, it's asking for God's purpose in your life. And it's, it's about when we ask for his purpose, we need to be living in his purpose. We need to be about his business and his commission. We've talked about this before when John Piper gives this example of what is prayer for? And he gives the examples, is prayer is like a wartime walkie-talkie, where when you're out in the battlefield, you use the walkie-talkie to call in reinforcements. Remember we've talked about that example before, right? And, and when you call in reinforcements for being in the battle, being about the purposes of what our commander-in-chief has told us to be about, he sends the answer to prayer. He gives even miraculous help at times. But the problem is, What we've done, like in James 4, is we've domesticated a wartime walkie-talkie into an intercom in the den. Instead of being out on the battlefield looking for reinforcements, we're in the den calling for more comforts, for pillows and tea to be brought up so that we can spend it on our own passion. What have we done? We're starting to not live in faith of God's purposes, but we're starting to live in a worldliness for our own kingdom. And prayer doesn't work. Now Jesus is saying, when I send you out, when the temple's gone and you are on your own, I want you to have such confidence in God that you're prepared to ask him to do things which might even seem impossible. Because when we are out for his commission, we are against the forces of darkness And we need God's power. And as one author says, when we trust in God for the right things in the right way, meaning right modems, we can have confidence that we always get the right response. That's empowered discipleship. That's fruitful discipleship. And there's another component of fruitful prayer and empowered discipleship, and that's having mercy towards others. Verse 25 When you stand praying, forgive. When you stand praying, what what you're doing when you're, you're standing in that posture, you're coming to God recognizing that you need God. You're dependent upon him. You come before him with your request. You pray because you recognize that relationship. And to pray, if we have faith in God, we recognize how needy we were. And how we don't deserve to come before his throne of grace. And how no one deserves it. That's faith in God, recognizing that we are only standing in front of his throne of grace because he has dealt with our sin. Recognizes our desperate condition. And that any sin that I've done against God is so much greater than anything that anyone does to me. That kind of faith then gives perspective when some injustice has been done to you. And you can forgive. And you don't hold it against someone. Look at the language. It says, forgive if you have anything against anyone. The meaning here is that you could hold something against someone. You could hold something over them. And when speaking of forgiveness, the Bible and Jesus often uses the image of debts to describe the nature of sins, right? Like like money debts, right? We've used the example before. Like if you owe me $1,000 and I forgive it, I absorb the loss. I absorb it. And when Jesus says forgive... This goes against our sense of justice in a sense. When someone wrongs you, there's a deep sense that the wrongdoer owes you. There's a real injustice, and our inclination, apart from God's grace, is that that we want to make them pay. And we can do it by hurting them, yelling at them, making them feel bad, just walking around with bitterness. And forgiveness means giving up that bitterness, not holding the debt against them, not seeking the right for repayment. And when we're sinned against, we we lose something. 
Maybe it's, maybe it's being in a state of happiness. Maybe we lose our peace of mind. Maybe we lose our reputation. Maybe we lose some kind of opportunity. Have you ever been slandered? Have you ever felt the pain of someone saying things that aren't true? And maybe it did cost you your reputation. And and maybe it maybe it did make you lose an opportunity. Can you take the loss? Maybe you're oppressed like the Jews and you're under hostile domination. They wanted Messiah to come in and destroy them. Maybe that's why they were all leaves and no fruit, because they're, they're, they're harboring this bitterness, like we talked about last week, a, a Jonah-type attitude. But, but how, can I, how can I continue to take the loss? How, how can I continue to absorb this deficit spending when we are sinned against day after day? We have to have faith in God and understand that, that true forgiveness towards others is the fruit of, of having received forgiveness from God and being transformed by His grace, having embraced it and and been melted and changed by it. You remember another passage where Jesus tells the parable when He's answering about forgiveness in Matthew 18. Peter asks about how we can forgive again, and He starts telling a a parable about a, a king who went to collect accounts And there was one who owed him billions of dollars. And the king went to him and and tried to get repayment. And the slave says, well, I'll try and repay you. He didn't even understand. He didn't even agree with how great his debt was. But the king showed mercy on him. And he forgave all his debt. And the same guy went out to someone who owed him real debt, maybe $10,000, a real debt. And he says, you need to pay me. And the guy cried out for mercy. And he wouldn't give it. He threw him in jail. And, and word got back to the king. Didn't you understand? I forgave you billions and, and, and you didn't forgive this guy? Shouldn't you have forgiven him? If you had really understood your condition, you would have forgiven him. And, and he says, if you don't forgive, Jesus says at the end, if you don't forgive, God won't forgive you. And, and it's not... It's not earning. It's understanding the grace you've received. The positive side of that parable is if you've understand the the depth of grace you've received, you have a wellspring which can allow debt against you to go away and not even matter because you have everything in Christ. It doesn't mean we can earn God's forgiveness at the the end of Mark 11.25. It says, forgive so that your Father in heaven will forgive you. We don't earn God's forgiveness through forgiving, but it shows that if we're unforgiving, it can disqualify us from receiving his forgiveness because it can mean that we don't have faith. We don't have faith in God because we haven't trusted his forgiveness. No heart that's truly repentant towards God can can be unforgiving. No heart that's truly understood this wellspring of grace can can cling long-term to bitterness. Yes, we that sin rears its head sometimes. But when we have faith in God... We won't hold fast to an unforgiving spirit because that only proves that we don't trust in him. So fruitful discipleship empowered by God's grace is a forgiving faith. Prayer, unforgiveness, the disciples are going to need this because their situation is about to change. They're going to have great challenges to their their faith. They're going to have great sins done against them. And they will need to remember these very lessons, to have faith in God, to come to him in dependent prayer, to to forgive others so that Christ is magnified and not just their own reputations. They need to remember, we need to remember, and the question is, do we remember? Do we continue in this faith? Do you lay hold of God in faith that that works out in, in prayer for the accomplishment of his purposes? Do you hold the kind of faith that will release us to be merciful to others and and let other sin go away? It's not about going to the temple. It's not about saying prayers, not going to a church building, but it's about being prayerful. So often we can say prayers, but we don't pray. He's saying have a praying faith. I appreciate this one author asking about how you're praying and how you're forgiving. 
And when we ask those questions, it, it tells us something what we think about our sin and, and our own ability. If we think little of sin, then we pray little confessing our sin. If we don't have regular repentance and confession, we, we don't understand the depth of what's going on. If you think much of your own ability, you probably spend little time asking God for direction or strength. You probably spend little time looking to pursue his agenda. I mean, if, if we have such a high view of our own ability, why do we need to go to him? If your world revolves just around what you can control, well, then you pray very little. But if your world revolves around his commission and you understand what we're up against, we will pray for the gospel advance. And God can and will accomplish incredible things. And his goodness will overflow in our lives. Father, we come before you asking, increase our faith, help our unbelief, help us to have the kind of faith which looks to you dependently in prayer, that trusts you for all goodness, that we would, in what we ask for, seek to see your name glorified, and that Christ would be precious to us more and more day by day. We pray in his name. Amen.